Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. Our webinar today is on Blackboard Ultra Groups tool and best use cases. We have Professor JNY, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science. So thank you so much for joining us. Our session goal is really to get started with using Blackboard Ultra Groups and learn those best practices. Professor JNY will go over real use cases. So some issues that she was having and then how she used Blackboard Ultra Group's tool to solve those issues and really engage her students. At the very end, we'll have closing, which is next steps and Q&A. I'll also be sharing some resources throughout in the chat box. If you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box or unmute and just speak up. Uh, Professor, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, as I already said, my name is Jasmine Noel Yarish, or Dr. JNY for short. It gets long and complicated, so I tell people just call me Dr. JNY. And yes, sometimes that means my students call me Dr. Jenny, which is nowhere close to my name, but I find it hilarious. Um, so I am an assistant professor of political science in the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences in CAS. Um, I joined the faculty at UDC in fall 2020 pandemic fall. Um, so this is my six, second year here. And uh, within, I always like to tell David and Fatma both know this, within two, three years, I had to cross four different LMS platforms um, from for, in th three different institutions. Uh, but I really kind of enjoy thinking through how we can adapt these tools and use them better to facilitate our own kind of learning processes. So I'm going to definitely share my screen. I have a couple of slides, not big ones. Um, and I'm gonna, that means I'm going to stop sharing the other screen. Not a lot of big slides, but I wanted to share a couple of things regarding thinking about groups and why we might want to use groups, um, the groups function. Okay. So Excellent. thank you so much. Here we go. So as I said, that's that's who I am. This is today, and I wanted to think about why we wanted to use some groups. So these are the things going through my head every time I try to set up um, my LMS platform to set up um, for whether I'm doing in-person classes, I like to have a very structured learning management system platform um, in order to help keep students accountable. One of the reasons I think I do it is because we, um, we've, a lot of us have had challenges trying to hold uh, students accountable to syllabi, getting them to read them. Um, and and also that has a lot to do with the fact that sometimes our syllabi, syllabi are changing over the course of the semester as we get student feedback. So the um, course content on an LMS platform like Blackboard Ultra, which is the one that we use, is really helpful for keeping them accountable. So these are the two thoughts. And my question to everybody in the room is, have you ever had one or both of these following thoughts um, when you think about using groups in our Blackboard Ultra setting? So one, my class is so small, why would I ever use groups tool on Blackboard Ultra? Or there must be a way to scaffold my flipped, flipped classroom assignments into our LMS system, but what is it? What is that scaffolding? So has anybody ever had that? You can throw up your hands, you know, put in your, you know, thumbs up in your chat. Have you ever thought of these before? Or had faculty say to you, oh, our classes are so small, why would I ever use this? Okay, great. So these are exactly the questions that I had when I went, when I, every time I approached this, this project. So one of the things that I really learned in a lot of the, the kind of classes that I've taken through Cal are these questions about um, collaborative learning, right? So collaborative learning uh, is, is part of the flipped classroom design. Group work is part of collaborative learning. So before we move into the nuts and bolts of this, I want to give people an option, the, the option to participate early and kind of answer the question, what tools have you used to promote collaborative learning in your classroom, regardless of setting or formal or format? And yes, as we participate with this question, thank you, Professor. Um, I sent you a message uh, on the chat, Professor. If you could check that real quick. And everyone else, if you'd like to contribute, go ahead and put that in the chat box or uh, unmute. Oops. All right. Hopefully I fixed that out a little bit more <laughs> um, with the fuzziness. Did it, get, did it go away? Uh, hopefully the sound sounds a little bit better. My apologies. No worries. I could hear you. So thank you so much. All right. Um, uh, so 
Drew, you had your hand up. I was wondering if that was just your hand up saying, I've heard this, or did you have a collaborative tool that you wanted to share? Well, I think you were, wasn't the question like, have you ever wanted to maybe have a, uh, a collaborative tool that could use something like this functionality in an in education platform in an LMS? Great, yes. Okay, so the, something I've been looking at is I'm a psychologist by training. So I'm, I'm interested in how people would be able to use their LMS as a basis for clinical training. And it kind of generalizes to lots of things. For example, psychology, counseling, nursing, consulting. I mean, things where you might be wanted to do, you know, uh, clinical training with someone, either alone or typically alone, or in a small group, and then maybe recorded. Uh, it's really commonly done in... in in, in person clinical training programs and then you people just would record it like on video or something else but for virtual it might be kind of fun to have that set up that way i i know that you can do things like that if, if you're using zoom professional version uh you know the setup with the right the right gizmos but i don't haven't heard of anybody doing that in blackboard but probably somebody is Great. Yeah, I think that's a really good thought of how to, you know, promote this kind of collaborative learning process and using these tools. Um, in the chat, Fatma talked about Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Suite 365 and other Web 2.0 tools that we use for collaboration. Dr. B wrote um, Padlet. So we definitely can think of um, collaborative learning through technology. But what about just like general, if you didn't have any technology and you were in person, what are the tools that you use for promoting collaborative learning, even in an in-person setting without a technological tool? Anybody have thoughts? Planner, yep. Yeah, Planner's my new favorite application, to be honest. <laughs> I will have to look awesome. into that one. Um, you know, and one of the things that I think a lot of professors use just on a regular, even in virtual space, and we use them in in-person, is just small groups, right? So the groups function helps with creating those kind of collaborative spaces in a lot of ways. Technology can do it, but we can also do it through those very kind of low tech, just getting people into a breakout room or into small groups in a classroom um, and how that kind of lays our lays out um, some of this collaborative aspects. So the, la the last slide that I have is actually bring us, bringing us to Blackboard itself. So Blackboard Ultra states from the beginning, right, assigning roles. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Assigning specific roles to groups, which is what I'm going to get to in a little bit. Um, when you go to the help page, which um, David, I think, is going to share in the chat. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the help page for Blackboard Ultra at the very top for the instruction instructors, it li they literally say um, you can create groups based on real life practicalities of teamwork. Collaborative learning offers many benefits over traditional instruction. So the designers of Blackboard Ultra already thought through and was, were thinking about creating um, a system that was very much built towards collaborative work and collaborative learning. So if this is the intention, where are the hiccups? Because not a lot of us are actually using this tool, even though it kind of conforms and was designed for all of our, the, all the things that we have in mind, all the things that we're doing. So I wanted to go ahead and I'm gonna stop sharing this screen because I'm gonna to go to something else in a second. I wanted to go ahead and kind of walk you through um, how I've developed using tools based off of a case um, in my classroom. And I'm gonna do it by actually starting with my syllabus itself. I know, we still write syllabi, we still have to write those syllabi, we have to turn them in, and thinking about those syllabi, and also reflecting on those syllabi, because we're, we're coming up to the time of doing our reflections on our syllabi for the year, I wanted to kind of walk through um, that process, and what it looks like, and how I adapted it to um, Blackboard Ultra. So this is a syllabus for a a research class that I that I taught in the fall 2021 um, and the objective or the course this this course is about um, ushering students through the research process this is kind of the middle course where students have already selected their topic they've done a preliminary literature review they've come up with a preliminary research problem or research question and now they're uh, they're going to learn the different techniques that they can use to answer their question 
um, depending on how it's formulated. So course objectives effectively deploy various quantitative and qualitative research methods with cognition of their limitations and benefits, cultivate a set of best practices for giving constructive feedback for peer writing. Here's where we can use group work as well for, peer, for constructive feedback. Demonstrate discipline related in writing, analytical communication, etc., and translate research knowledge into marketable skills for graduate school, internship, and or employment applications. So one of the things, that in order to get at those objectives, especially the one about peer feedback, um, but also just peer assessment, and and question development, right? Deploying quantitative and qualitative research methods requires question development. I've integrated what I um, uh, what I like to call discussion facilitators in the classroom. So this is my version of a flipped classroom. As opposed to using the language of presentation, I want them to be discussion facilitators because what I really want them to do is develop questions about the readings that they've selected um, at the out outcome of the course, or at the, at the beginning of the course. So if I scroll down, I'm gonna see that I've created this idea of, you know, annotated bibliography and discussion facilitation. This is my assignment for them. They know this in advance. So you will be assigned a reading, you know, you individually or you and one of your peers will be just assigned a reading from either the third or fourth unit of the course. Um, one annotated bibliography free entry they have to turn in for your assigned reading for that reading, as well as a leading class discussion on that reading during class. Um, then that's broken down. Discussion facilitation is worth one, eight points. The actual turning in of the annotated bibliography is worth eight points. So I've done this and uh, a lot in different classes, but having a way to get the LMS to actually line up individually, because not all of the students will be working on the same reading in the same week, or not all the students will be working on the same set of readings or the same unit. So I wanted to find a way to use groups um, for, uh, in order to kind of structure this. Also for transparency, I think I had roughly a dozen students in this class, and I had a dozen readings for this assignment. So I, it definitely became a one-on-one -on -one thing, right? So going back to that question, I, we have small classes, why would I ever use the groups function? In actuality, it becomes really easy to use it for, for this very design, this design that I wanted to use. So I'm gonna walk, bring you back to my uh, module real quick from that class and I'm going to walk you through where groups is first located um, on the on the page so you have your module you have your course um, shell uh, for the whatever class you were working on for say the summer or, the, or next fall and over here on the left you see your beautiful picture right which is always nice make sure you have your picture there because it makes it nice to see you and you can always tell your students hey Go look for my picture and then go down there and you'll find how to, you know, look at your announcements, etc. So pictures are helpful. Um, you have your roster, course descriptions, and then it has this thing called course groups. View sets and groups. So if we click on that, it opens up the groups. As you can see, I have two groups here um, based off of the, that, that element, that assessment that's already in the syllabus. So I've broken it up to the qualitative methods articles and the quantitative methods articles. I could have called this unit three and unit four. Again, if I go back over to my, um, sorry about that, if I go back over to my syllabus and I scroll down, you guys would see this in the units designed here, unit three, and then we have the readings. All right, but for just for my purposes, I named them based off of the content that's there. So I have two groups. Notice there are six student, six groups in the one group and eight groups in another. So what does that mean? It's a really good question. When you set up a group assignment, but you want it to be graded individually, within that larger group, you have to create even smaller groups, right? So what do I mean by that? When you create the group, the big group, um, you can then custom design it to add students that you've assigned or have selected that article, which is what I did. You can also randomly assign or self-enroll, um, et cetera. And you just set up the number of groups that you want. Or I do it by, I did it by custom and I just selected my students. So scrolling down, 
Um, as I said before, I ha at, earlier in the class, within the first three weeks, I had the students um, read the abstracts for each one of the articles they had to select, and they had then they told me in class which one they wanted to do. So I knew then. So I created a group for that reading, and then assigned the discussion the discussant to that group. So I'm going to unassign Ira real quick so I can show you how to assign her. So I've created a group. You can just use the little plus sign to create the group. Change the name. I changed it to Nuema 2020 because that is the name of the article. Push. Oh, so it says that name is taken, but <laughs> everybody kind of understands what I what I mean by that. Um, close. No, I've lost it. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, so I create that that particular the that particular name, and then I add. So I'm going to unassign her real quick so I can actually show you how this works. They put the bank of the students at the top um, and you should see all of your students name there, names there that are available to be put into a group. Um, and Ira is now here. There's one of nine. I'm going to click on her little three dots and I'm going to add her to the Noema group that I've already created in advance and it puts her there. So then she is in that group. The same for Hancock. Um, and I had technically two read two students for Hancock. Um, the reason I still separated them out into discussion discussant one and discussant two is if I put them in the same group, they would have they would have to turn in one assignment collectively. I still wanted for this assignment to the for them to turn in the annotated bibliography, an individual one written by um, the individual student. But I could have put them together. Um, so what type of activities in Blackboard can you use groups for? That's a really good question. You can use them for almost every single activity. Um, you can use them for graded activities and ungraded activities. Um, so if you wanted to do a, a group for a discussion board, you can do that as well. And I'm going to show you kind of how to do that in a little bit. But I just wanted to walk you through um, this one element of how you just do the functionality of putting people in. I also encourage you as instructors because this is not really explained on Blackboard Ultra in the descriptions or in that short video. Um, there's a short video that kind of goes through the um, how to create course groups. It's a really great short video. It's two minutes so if you need a refresher you can always go back there and that'll be provided by by um, David in the chat. Ah, I lost my tab again which is always fun. <laughs> I'm gonna go back here. Um, it's not suggested, but I've learned that if you are trying to show the students um, how to locate their group assignment, um, you have to at, you know, use the student view function in Blackboard Ultra. I really encourage you to make sure you put your dummy version of yourself into that group as well. So remember, the larger group is this one group called Qualitative Methods. I'm gonna go back to the, the main function. All right, I've created a group called Qualitative Methods, and I could create a new group called um, Blackboard Ultra Group Best Practices, and I'm going to hit Save. I haven't added anybody to that group yet. I've just made it custom. I click on it. I can go in and add people to that group as a whole, or I can make it subgroups again create custom subgroups within that group, within that assignment or that activity. Um, now that I have this group, this uh, Blackboard group best practices, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go into creating a new assessment or a new assignment, all right? So, uh, or an activity. One of the most common collaborative activities in Blackboard Ultra. Does anybody want to guess what it is? Yes, but you have to create a DB for them. Yes. Anybody want to guess what is the most common used collaborative function in Blackboard Ultra right now? Discussion? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Fatma, because Fatma knows this. Everybody uses discussion boards, right? So if you wanted to create a discussion or a new discussion for our Blackboard best practices, um, Black, yeah, Blackboard best practices 
four groups. I created a discussion. Um, this discussion isn't graded, but if I want to make it graded, right, I can click on it and I can grade it and I can assign it to groups. And once you assign it to groups, you can pick which group you want to assign it to or create, create a new group. Um, I can enter my search term here, Blackboard, I think. Oh, okay, it's not going to show it to me. I forgot about that. I'll have to fix that later. But you can create a, um, a new group here um, if you'd like in order to add those in. Sometimes I believe you can find groups that are already there. Yes, you can. So under where it says your student groups, you can custom assign to create a new group, or I can go in and select a group I've already created in advance, right, and assign them to this new activity. And I just hit save, and now they're assigned for it. Again, um, I don't have to yet grade that discussion. I could just leave it as ungraded, but I can save it. And now we see that this is a group discussion. So the, only those people in that group will be on that discussion board. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Excellent. And I see a question in the chat box. Do you ever use the self-enrollment option for groups? Why or why not? Yeah, that's a really good question. I have not yet, <laughs> um, but I actually I'm starting to think um, that I told you about this. This um, I, I was trying to show this case that I use in my class where the students have to select an actual reading. Now, could I go in there and create all of this in the backlog of it and say only one person can select per or those subgroups, et cetera? Yes, I think I will probably use the self-enrollment at some time. I hadn't mm -hmm. yet because at that time I didn't really know how to do it. Yeah. So now that I've been using it for a while just on this end, I think it's like a lot of us. Uh, or like I think of this, I think of learning um, management systems a lot like learning a new language. You got to get the basic structure down. <laughs> Once I can do that, then I can expand and I can get more detailed with it. And I think this is a good opportunity to do that as I was reviewing how I've been using groups, rereading the kind of options that are out there provided by Blackboard Ultra, um, and of course how seeing how other people might use this use groups. That has helped me. Um, think more about how to use that function. And the self-enrollment, I think, would cut down on time. Oh. And definitely in an asynchronous course, I would absolutely want to do it that way, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why I'm learning how to do it. I just haven't been in um, into that process yet. Hopefully that makes sense for questions. Yep, yeah, that was great. And then I see another one. Uh, do you recommend no more than four people per group? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it depends. Mm -hmm. um, on what the activity is. So yes, for there's a there's um, if the activity is a say a discussion board where the students are 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 um, asked to post a link to um, a video on YouTube mm -hmm. that they found on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, and that they had to watch a video, one of the other videos from a student, and then and then comment on it. Um, the more videos you have in a post, right? Like think of our normal discussion boards. The more yep. you have in the post, the fewer um, you know people might just view the videos that are closest to them or what mm -hmm. have you, and to, to do the follow up kind of activity within a discussion board. So if you create smaller ones, right? Maybe four, maybe five. I think it just depends on what is the, the what is the structure of the assignment if there are two people that are the discussion leaders of that discussion board um or the discussion facilitators and they they're the ones that are required to post the videos having maybe four people respond to those videos um mm -hmm. might be a good thing so you might want eight it just depends on what the assignment is really in the long run um for me but i do mm -hmm. think that there's something to be said about rule of fours or rule of threes definitely <laughs> Yeah. Um, and can you add your preview user account to all of your groups? Yes, that is a really good question. Can you can you add it to all of your groups? Absolutely. So I'm going to actually go back and show that real quick because Thank you. that is something I did not know I could do. <laughs> and then when I figured it out, it's like, haha, this is really helpful. Um, so let's go back to, um, I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to delete this. And yes, I'm deleting that. I don't need that there, so I don't forget. Um, I'm gonna go back to my groups. Again, over here on details and actions, course groups, view and sets of groups. 
So, for example, um, and I'm going to delete this because I'm going to forget two days from now what that's for. Um, if I go into my qualitative methods articles group, right, and I've made subgroups under that one group, I only need to add me once. I don't need to add me to each one of these subgroups, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I can unassign members or I can add a number, another member because I, I, you only show up once at the top under each group. So you only need to add it once. However, I have two groups, right, that I've set up um, for students for this assignment. I am also, I didn't assign myself to this, but I could assign myself, so for example, to the Dunaway Aid All. And I'm in here with my other student, um, but that's okay because the, all of these students, Cop Copliam, Kelsey, Antoinette, etc., will see the assignment. They'll see the larger assignment of their qualitative methods article annotated bibliography, and they know individually um, what their their reading is. So I'm actually going to show you what this assessment, this assignment looks like. Actually, cancel. I'm going to save that real quick. So I'm going to go into um, my course to show where this assignment lies. So I'm in Unit 3. The end of Unit 3, we've done all of the readings. They have their annotated bibliography for qualitative readings, six groups. When I click on this, oh, sorry. Let me actually do this from a, for the student preview real quick so I can walk everybody through this. Right, that was the whole point of this, <laughs> to show from the student's front side. So I'm a student, I'm in my class, I know I have selected a reading from Unit 3 that I will be responsible to turn in my annotated bibliography of my reading of that reading, right? Uh, at the end of Group 3, I find annotated bibliography for qualitative readings. Um, and I'll be, I see that there's new Group 1. That's me, that's telling me that I'm in that, I'm one of those groups, right? I'm part of um, that assignment, right? But if I look at, I look further, well, you're actually going to see me in both assignments. I look further down to the end um, of, of Unit 4, same thing. Annotated bibliography, qualitative readings. I should be in there too. Um, past assignment, it, that's okay. So once I open up the assignment, um, you know, all the students will see the same, just, you know, um, what the assignment is, those who are there, um, the example that I've, that I've given, um, and they also have the list of their name and their assigned reading. So if they've forgotten, because they're not looking at the groups, I've already put it there, so then they, they can submit their piece. The point is, is that if you do not add yourself to the group and you have assignments and you're trying to show them to students during class, like this is how you submit this assignment, you won't be able to do that. All right. So I know that there were a couple other questions that I wanted to ask. Do you have to create groups each time or is it saved so you can assign it for new activities? Absolutely, you do not have to create new groups each time. If um, you create your groups at the beginning, um, you can uh, you can definitely um, keep those groups the entire way through. Um, if you wanna change them up to create a new group, you can absolutely do that as well. Um, but if there are uh, from the very beginning of the class that the students know that they're going to be in discussion, they're going to be part of discussion facilitation group A, you can create that and it stands throughout the course. And if you have them do different kinds of assignments, absolutely, you can use them that way. I know there was another question that I skipped over earlier um, that I wanted to get to. And I can't yeah, remember. Let's see. Oh, can students communicate with one another in their groups? That's the one I was looking for. Yeah. So um, I was like, I wanted to show that because that one is not as intuitive as one might mm -hmm. think. Um, so if we go to, right, I'm in the student preview, I can view groups to join or groups that I'm in. Um, this says I can join this group, but um, I can't really join because they're locked. So what you see is, I see that I'm part of the Dunaway A All group, that's me, I'm in that group. I also can see that I'm in new group one, right, in that group. Um, so I can see what group I'm in as well by just looking at, at, the, at the view groups to join, but really it's just view groups. Now, can you message each other? Absolutely. But you have to go to the messages function, and I'm going to create a message, and I'm going to type in, right, so I have... Um, all of my students' names are here, etc. 
But what I would do is really, I can't, I don't see group names there, but how can you see group names? I'm actually gonna show you a different class for that. Um, because what you have to do is, you have to do a little bit more legwork as an instructor to set this up. So I'm actually gonna go into a class that I taught last, ooh, no, this is not the right summer, fall. Oh, I don't think they're there anymore. <laughs> I think the classes aren't there anymore, so that's okay. I'm gonna show you a different way to do it. So um, let's see if I have it. Let's just click here. Do I have one in here? Ah. Okay, so here we go. So we have our um, Embassy Task Force teams. This is from another class that I, 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 I did over the fall. And you have the blue team, the green team, the red team, etc. So um, when you're, um, as an instructor, you're viewing, you can view your sets and you view your groups. And um, I'm gonna click on this group and I have the red team, the Philippines, and these are all the people in that team. Notice I'm also assigned to that team. But again, remember, you only have to sign yourself to one team within a larger group structure um, so that you can see it. In the top right, you have these little three button, again, the little three dots. Um, you can unassign members, but you can also message the group. So once you message the group and say, hi, red team, congrats on representing the Philippines, right? Uh, I didn't spell Philippines right because I have to check my my spelling. And then I can send it to them. I can also make sure I send an email copy to each one of them. What that means is that this message will now be saved in their message boxes and they'll see everybody who's on their name of group. I'm not going to send it because why would I try to get my students from last semester to, to pay attention to something right now. But I can show you what this looks like in your message boxes, right? Um, in the end. So when you go back to messages, um, I can see, I can like find one of my messages to that group and the students would see only their messages on their end, right? Um, this is probably really early when I got them assigned teams or something to that effect. Um, but you have to send them out one message and then they all know it. So there isn't quite a clear way of integrating them. There's not like in the messages I can, you know, send out to just the group, but you can do it through the group function as an instructor. And then once they have that message, right, they'll see it back. I think I probably could see it in my student preview, but I'm not sure. That's the, the funny part. So hopefully Yeah, but that's a great idea to send a message first, right? So that they know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't come up in my student view, probably because it could like clear the cache. But hopefully that makes it, you can definitely, as I said, send them messages, but you would def, you want to make sure that you send it from, as the instructor from the group's set, setting. And sending them at the start is always great. Is this course face-to-face? -face? Which one, Fatma? Uh, the, the one that, both of them. Uh, no, the, the layout like is really uh, impressive. No, they're not face to face yet. I've only been teaching digitally or virtually for since I've been here, um, but mostly. So it's not asynchronous too. It's a it's a virtual class. It's a virtual class, virtual class, but it's it is synchronous. So it's been asynchronous classes the whole time. Mm -hmm. Very impressive design, Doctor Yarish. Really, very impressive. So we've talked. About, can you add uh, your preview account to all your groups? Yes, um, self using self enrollment, I answered. I know that we're kind of like hop two questions. So, um, and I'm happy to like walk through any of those other things. Um, I also tend to, um, you know, if you assign your groups at the beginning, but the actual group activity is not really till the end of the class, you can always remind them through a group message saying, hey, you know, do some team building with your group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, th that's definitely one thing to do. But this has been excellent so far, uh, Professor. Uh, do you have time to talk a little bit about hypothesis and how you're using groups for that, if you don't sure. mind? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Thank you so much. So one of the things that um, I've been using hypothesis for quite, for ever since um, we moved from Blackboard Learn to Blackboard Ultra. And the reason for that is there was a really, I forget what it was. In fact, you can rem if you remember, that would be great. There was a platform in, um, and learn, I think it was like web pages where students could collaborate in a single web page or something. Yes. Um, okay.
Um, and, and that kind of collaborative mechanism I used to use for things like concepts and key terms and readings. What was it called? Yeah, wikis. 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 Thank you. I loved the wikis. The wikis were my, I learned the wikis and I was like, oh, yay, I learned how to use this function. And then it went away. And I'm sure other people are like, damn it, the wiki is gone, right? But um, <laughs> um, the, the hypothesis works really well for how I was using the wiki. Um, because I was using it as a way to hold students accountable to reading because a lot of my readings are very much term based and I want them to understand key terms and find them, locate them, find definitions, etc. So um, hypothesis was really great for that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but as we know, a hypothesis has all of these other kinds of functionalities and now they have a group function. So um, I encourage you to look at the video that was done between Cal and hypothesis it was about a little over a month ago, I think it was five weeks or so, um, which we've put in the chat, um, hypothesis with groups. Again, you do have to create the groups in the backside of Blackboard first. So everything that I just showed you, you would have to do first. Um, uh, but the great thing is that you can put them as groups. Now, if you're assigned, again, if you are still assigning um, an individual grade to those students, I encourage you to break them up individually within the larger group if they're all looking at the same reading um, because you want to give them an individual grade. But if it's not an individual grade, if it is a collective grade, you can also just put them in a group and they're fine to go and only those students will have that reading um, or and they will only have that annotation. Um, can groups see each other's annotations? People inside the group can see yeah their other annotations. So if you want to create a hypothesis where you're just trying to check the accountability of the reading individually for students, assigning them individually gives them, you know, just their reading. So they're not uh, jumping on board with other people's annotation. Um, so if you want to do a layering effect, right, over the course of the semester, so say, for example, you want to check your students' reading comprehension individually using hypothesis at the beginning of the se semester, maybe having a, a graded assignment where it's individual groups, that means one person per group, so then that you only see their annotations, and then move them forward into then a slightly larger group, and then a larger group on the same reading, and then you can see all of their annotations. I think that would be really good for... Um, in a lot of ways. So the solo group then to like a pair share kind of uh, duel into something larger. Um, yeah, because the annotation process is not as intuitive as we want to think it is. It's great. It's a lot of fun. But um, you will always have certain students that just do the I'm going to throw some great pictures in here and then other students who are <laughs> literally trying to do the reading. So how do you break that out and, and make that more feasible to get them to be more reflexive about their reading? I think that that could be a great way to use the tool. I'm working on that one. I haven't used it in that way yet because, um, again, the group function, I think, is only from January forward that they've created the groups in Hypothesis, yeah. so that's relatively recent, and I did not go back and change anything in my courses for the semester after that function uh, rolled out, but looking forward to thinking about using it summer, fall, coming forward. Um, can, uh, so yeah, Hypothesis, that's Hypothesis. <laughs> Excellent. And are there any other questions from the group here today? Yeah, I have a question yeah. I put in the chat. Uh, I wonder your student feedback, Dr. Yarish, about using the groups. I know that some faculty having issues with the student got confused. So I wonder how you really streamline that process. Yeah, I saw so that you're putting on the syllabus, but not necessarily yeah. stream the, streamline the process. I think so. I think the hardest part, and this is just a, the hard part with getting some of the students to understand the difference between the save button and the submit button. Okay. So when you're in a groups, if you use groups for a, an assignment like a collaborative paper or a colla uh, particularly a paper, not something like a journal, because journals don't require you to hit that submit button in this, the same way, right? You just post and it's there, just like a discussion board. Whereas if it's an assignment, a larger assignment like say um, a group of students are putting together a PowerPoint presentation and they have to submit it, right? Uh, or they're writing up um, a, a report on a film they watched and they're collectively writing it together. You can use the save function in the assignment uh, tool in Blackboard and the students can just go in and edit it at any time, kind of like the wiki, <laughs> kind of like the old wiki. Um, but they have to somebody before the deadline has to hit submit and if they don't hit the submit 
the faculty member never sees the assignment. So I think the biggest challenge, I think, in using groups in that way is that I haven't used groups in any way that has to do with um, submitting in that way. Um, so I haven't had that problem, but I think it's that's why design, I don't do it because I, I it's hard for me to communicate all of those layers to the students. Um, I have used it for a longer project, right? A much longer project where they've had to work through, um, where they're individually submitting little things, like as I said, those discussion boards, et cetera. And at the end, they have to write up one thing. Um, but it, I haven't really integrated it at that level. And I think that takes a lot of, a lot of effort to explain, um, particularly for students because it's challenging. It's challenging for them to understand that difference between save and submit. Because the save function is the function you want to use when you're doing group work. Because you want the other people to be able to come in and do that as well. But it's that moment from save to submit. And if somebody hits the submit before other people got to put on, get put their stuff in there, they can't add their stuff too. So I don't know if there's a way, right, to fix that. I think the best way to fix that is to, um, is the to use the journal or discussion boards as opposed to using the assignments for group assignments. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, and also to add uh, the uh, group assignment only one attempt, and this is makes the problem a little bit uh, problematic. And uh, journal, I would stay away with journal because journal is not collaborative tool in Ultra. It's uh, different than Blackboard uh, 901, but discussion board is. So uh, they can use the discussion or a uh, Word document, Microsoft 365, to be embedded there and they will be able to collaborate like the wiki. Yeah, and I think that's the one um, thing that you have to really think about. So if you are doing a long-term collaborative project where at the end of the semester they have to submit one document, using something like Microsoft 365, um, is a good idea because it's outside that platform. You don't have to worry about the saving, but making sure that there's somebody that is team leader to post it, right? Because it only needs to be posted once, right? And I've done this with things like, um, in a couple other classes I've taught where I've done podcasting projects at the end, um, it was, you know, the students had to submit the final script. Somebody had to be the person who actually ends up submitting it. Um, they took that lead, um, and if they chose to record it, the extra credit, they have to submit the recording. They have to do that, but it's still a group, and it's graded as a group, right? So that it has a rubric as a group. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit. I'm still learning, but I, as I said, I think that probably Microsoft 365, doing all of that collaborative work there. Again, the podcast, they're doing it somewhere else anyway, right, as well. So hopefully that helps. Excellent. And before we conclude, I do want to put the links from our uh, webinar today. So let me go ahead and go over those very briefly. So we have Professor Jasmine Yarish, her email is there, as well as mine. Uh, Blackboard Groups Info, that's from Blackboard itself, as well as a How to Create Course Groups. It's about a two-minute video. Great for a refresher. And Hypothesis with Groups. So that's our webinar that we did. Uh, with hypothesis that went over that group's tool. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback. So we have our survey right there and our office hours, our recorded webinar. So this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well as our website. If you do want to save this chat, if you look at the lower right corner of your chat box, there are three dots. Click on that and that'll save it to your computer. Uh, any final questions from the group? I just want to add if, if anyone interested of implementing group work in the course and they don't know where to start and or you have a face to face activity, come to Cal Ops hours, we will walk you through the process and we'll make sure um, it's uh, it will meet your standards. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and with that, actually, Professor, I'd love to ask you, what are some final thoughts um, where you can encourage your colleagues that may be hesitant to use Blackboard Ultra Groups? Tool. Yeah, so I think the thing, as I said before, um, particularly if you're doing online work that is collaborative, finding that ways to scaffold it in the back. Um, so hopefully my my example is one. I have more, so people can always reach out to me and we can talk through things. But the one thing that I wanted to suggest to everybody is um, 
if you want to find a way to hold students more accountable to their presentation times, to their, um, their discussion facilitation times, to those times, because we can just post and saying, okay, this is your discussion board with this reading, make sure you post them in advance, etc. That's fine, but you need to find, we need to find ways in order to hold them accountable, putting it in their calendar. So that's the great thing about creating your graded assignment, it puts it in the calendar. We can make it low stakes, right? It's one point, it's two points, it's whatever. But getting it into that board helps hold them accountable. And I think for um, asynchronous, this is really important. Um, as well because it, it, it helps in that way. That's how a lot of asynchronous students are checking their progress, right? They use their grade book to check their progress and that's um, and the grade book is a way to hold them accountable. So um, and as I said, going back to my point, I have such small classes. Why would I ever use groups? Because it's marketed as you have a large class. Break it down into these smaller groups to facilitate learning. But that's not really how it's marketed by Blackboard Ultra, right? They're really marketing it as this is about collaborative learning. So how do we, which we all agree, it makes for more success in our classrooms, for our learning objectives, for getting students not just through our classes, but through the IGED program, through our majors, right? Through the end of their degrees. Um, if that is the case, being being willing to experiment with those groups and create those mm -hmm. kind of functions, I think helps a lot. And it, th it takes time. But as I said, I'm still learning. I've given you what I've done, which seems very tiny, <laughs> I think, in, in the many ways that anybody could do this. But um, I have found it helpful. And I think the students appreciate it in the way that they say, you're very organized. I appreciate your organization. So I guess they are appreciating the way that I'm using the tool but I'm not using it in a way that makes them feel like somebody else might sabotage or hold their grade up hostage, right? That has always been my um, intentionality when trying to integrate these things into Blackboard Ultra. So hopefully that helps. It I do have one other question for you. Um, yeah. I love your background. So what are some of the things that you have behind you? That's a great, <laughs> great background for okay. online teaching. That's true. This is my office. Yeah. So if anybody's mm -hmm. on campus in 40. 250. I'm on the fourth floor. It's four, uh, 4218. 4218, okay. Um, so this up here, I'm a political scientist, so I have a lot of political memorabilia. This is actually from the year I was born, 1984. This is um, Mondel Ferrero's campaign. It's modeled after a very famous French painting called Liberty Carrying the People by Jean-Jacques mm -hmm. David, which is very tiny in this corner, but if you guys look up Liberty Carrying the People, You'll see it. It's a very famous painting from the French Revolution. Um, but it's Geraldine Ferrero, the first woman to ever be nominated by a major party to be vice president. And if now we have the first woman vice president happening right now, so I find it really fun. Mm -hmm. And um, Walter Mondale is over here. He's not as fun. But of course, you know, um, Shirley Chisholm is in my corner. So there's mm -hmm. that. And of course, my plant babies. So if anybody want to come see my plant babies, feel free to come see my plant babies. I, I love that. I have a whole political museum in here. I, okay. have a, I have a political buttons going back to 1908. Wow. I have a tour book, a tour, uh, sorry, a um, city guide from Philadelphia published in 1876, 75, excuse me, 75. Um, I have a lot of fun stuff. So come yeah. visit the traveling museum on the fourth floor. I know you guys are just upstairs. The Cal team will come. Uh, so we'll come. We're on the sixth floor, so we'll come to the fourth floor. No, That's up. easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Perfect. there's a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. But Professor, I can't thank you enough. This was such a valuable webinar for us and for everyone that's listening and watching this, even if it wasn't live. Uh, this is such a valuable resource. So I can't thank you enough for all your time. Um, this was really wonderful. And I remember you told me before to use groups and solo groups, and I never thought to do that before. But that's such a great idea. So I, I appreciate your time. Um, and thank you so much for leading this today. Thank you all so very much. I appreciate every single one of you. And those who have not yet met, I appreciate you too in our you know future meetings, <laughs> as always. So have a great um, rest of your afternoon and try to enjoy the sunshine before Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, everyone. Have a great day, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.